Yes, I, I mean, I don't have words to express how stoked and pumped I am to be here. Um, it's my third year. I'm really, la I'm really glad I didn't talk last year. Um, I just did a panel discussion because this gave me an extra year to really progress in the way I wanted to progress before I talked this year. Um, so, like I said, two years ago, I was here. I talked about what we were doing at Amass. I was really uncomfortable with it because we were just kind of coming into this new way of thinking and, and cooking, and I, w I didn't know really how to talk about it, aside from it being the first time I really stood in front of that many people and talked, I was shitting myself. I'm a bit more confident now, <laughs> not only because in what we're doing, I think in the last six to nine months, we've really developed a path in which we wanted to go down. Um, but I really wanted to take that discussion and kind of recap on that. Um, but in doing this, in writing this one, I quickly realized that that discussion two years ago turned into an obsession. And, and a, a good, a good <laughs> obsession. Um, but before I go on, I, let me just, for, the, for those of you who do, do not know what a mass is, um, we are situated in an old warehouse just outside of Copenhagen. It closed down in 96. Um, it's a place people thought, okay, you're crazy for opening a restaurant out there, you're never going to succeed. Uh, I said, no, you're wrong, because we built this outside. We have a 900 square meter garden. We have a polytunnel that runs on aquaponics. And I never take this space for granted because this space really inspired the direction in which we are going right now. All right, back to obsession. I have really um, become obsessed with numbers and percentages. And my wife hates about it because at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm in bed on my phone. Well, not in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning anymore because I just had a little girl. Um, but this is the average upscale restaurants statistics of what they produce um, in byproducts. And this is where we were in 2013 when we opened. And we weren't that far off in two years ago from this as well. And like I said, it's only the last two years since I spoke that I feel like we've kind of gone in this direction and really challenged everything that I talked about. And, but what I've really learned is this is this is working and cooking in a different state of mind. And JP and I have talked a lot about um, how do you make a, how do you make a conference? This better not be taken off my time, JP. No. <laughs> Can you hear me? Perfect. So. JP and I talked about how do you take a conference like this and hold people accountable for what they talk about? Because we're here for three days, everyone leaves, everyone pats each other on the back, and then everyone goes back to their daily lives. So I wanted to take this opportunity to hold myself accountable for what I talked about two years ago. So I'm going to give you guys a little update two years on uh, about what we're doing at Amass. This is the statistics at Amass right now. Um, what I thought and the goal was if we could flip the numbers as opposed to 84% to the landfill and uh, whatever else to recycling, we wanted to, yeah, this is, we've, we've almost flipped it. We're not quite there yet. Um, and just so you don't think I'm BSing you and just throwing some random numbers up here, this is the breakdown of what we're doing. Just take a picture of it because I'm not going to stay on the slide forever. Um, but uh, you see, upcycled product, that's something that has affected us drastically and what's going to the landfill um, and what's not going to the landfill. Um, how, so all these numbers are great and I am obsessed with it, but something else came out of this whole process that really was, I think for all of us that work at Amass, was unexpected. And it was a creative part of this whole puzzle that we're putting together. And it was a creative process that was inspired by this. This, uh, this, this creative process uh, has basically, for the last nine months, 
really been pushing the creativity out of mass. Um, it's been, we've been, I mean, we've started this intense process of upcycling all these different products into something that's delicious. We have found uh, flavors in things that we weren't expecting, uh, which has been really interesting. Um, but the inspiration we're getting, I think we're, I think we're getting more inspiration from stuff like this, or this, or this, and I, I hate to say it, as opposed to stuff like this. And we are really looking at what we are producing as byproducts and how do we turn those into something delicious? Because, I mean, delicious is, the, is a word we use most often in the restaurant because it doesn't matter what you do to create something and take it, this kale stems and turn them into something else. Unless it's delicious, you're not going to convince anybody of what you're doing is the right thing. Um, but through these various processes of uh, addressing our trim and reducing it and upcycling it, we've been able to reduce our the output of stuff going to the bin um, by 75% since we've opened. Um, but like I said before, the most unexpected thing was the flavors we started to discover through fermentation, through drying, through pickling, through pickling and drying, then fermentation, through combinations of these different processes. Um, we started to find flavors like this. This is the stems of all of our plants that we save over the week, including leaves that have a little brown on it or a hole in it that we can't put on the plate. We save them up all week long. We salt them. We dry them, we make a paste out of them, spread it thin, and I'm telling you, you cannot tell the difference between that and a really good nori. We started recently, uh, in the last six months, uh, making amino acid sauces, uh, or the same process of soy sauce. This is made out of our leftover potato bread, um, inoculated with koji, and then blended with a 10% salt brine, and let's sit for two months. This one. This is a recent one. We have one up there that's about nine months old, and it tastes like the most amazing tamari you've ever tasted. Um, all right, so now you've kind of seen what we're doing in that aspect. So, okay, great, you're making all this soy sauce, you're making all this uh, fermented, fermented herb stems. How do you put this together on a plate? And JP and I were just talking, JP's like, I'm really glad not a lot of people are putting pictures of their dishes up and talking about themselves. I'm sorry, JP, here we go. <laughs> um, this is the best way for me to kind of show you the end product of uh, this process that we're going through. So this is what you get when you sit down at a mess. It's four types of chips based completely on the different trim we're producing in the kitchen. So we don't buy anything in aside from the tapioca starch for this. It is, we have carrots seasoned with our leftover coffee grinds, fennel with the dried fennel tops and vinegar, potato, our leftover potato bread with dried yogurt and black pepper, and onion with onion skin ash. This dish right here, I'm probably the most proud of because it is something that really embodies everything that we think about. This is the absolute entire pumpkin, not one pumpkin, but the entire spectrum of the pumpkin in one dish. Underneath is the, the skins of the pumpkin, which we put through the same process as black garlic, turns into a flavor that's so similar to mole. There's the pumpkin cooked soft, and then on top the powder is made from all the guts of the pumpkin that's been salted, and then dried and grind to a powder. And it starts to taste like sumac a little bit. Carrots, three types of carrots, pickled in all of our leftover tea leaves from tea service. Underneath is a, what we call a nut ricotta, and this is almond pulp from our almond milk turned in the texture of ricotta cheese. And we serve this to a lady that was allergic to dairy, and she had an allergic reaction because in her mind, we said ricotta, even though we told her there's no dairy in it, trust me, in her mind, she had an re allergic reaction to the ricotta cheese. At the time, it wasn't very funny. It's, yeah, we all laugh about it now. This is our potato bread. Um, the condiment is actually the, the focus here. All of the, the rhubarb pulp from rhubarb juice we take 
We cook down with shallots for about eight hours, almost like the same process of making an exo sauce. And then we puree it, bind charred kales with it. The condiment on, or the green on top is a, is a, I guess, for lack of a better word, a pesto made of kale stems. This is all the herbs from the garden at the time. Uh, there's an emulsion that's made with all of our leftover lemon skins. Um, we are brewing our own beer right now, so all of our pitched beer yeast uh, blended with the lemons and a bit of chili and left to, f left to sit for about, know, about seven days, and then we emulsify oil into it. Almost the same process of uh, making a kosho. Um, all of our black currant uh, trim or berries that uh, we, we can't use because they're smashed, we dry, make a powder out of it. And uh, beetroot and rhubarb. So the rhubarb pulp that we use in the, in the um, condiment, this is where the pulp came from, from the juice for this. Beetroots roasted in coffee grinds. The, there's a rhubarb in uh, culture cream sauce hidden in there. And then the crumble is made from all of our grains left over from brewing beer, um, salted, and then dried, and then mixed with Douglas fir pine. So this is, this is kind of how we're cooking now at a mass. And like I said, it's only the last six to nine months that I feel we have, uh, we have really kind of found the direction we want to go. But there's one thing that I really have learned uh, that over this kind of course, the last two years, is that if we want to, if we want this way of approaching Pranus to become the norm, then it's really important that we learn a new language to talk about them. We need to stop calling this waste cooking or trash cooking and stop using those words trash and waste because if we keep using those words, that's all the stuff is going to be. They, they are another product that we are working with. So, I guess to kind of sum it up, at a mass, we're in this for the long run. We are committed to this way of working. Um, for us, you know, I, I worked for Thomas Keller for a long time, and the, he has his core values, and, and when you work for Thomas Keller, it's like joining a cult, and you can't ever get it out of you. But impact is one of these, part of these core, va core values. So, for us... For me, this is part of a bigger picture about having an impact on the, on the industry as a whole. But not only the restaurant industry, but all the different li the links in the food chain. Um, because if we want to keep using the products that we're using, we need to use them in a more productive, a more, a way that we fully utilize what we have. Because if we don't, and this is said all the time, the generations that come after us are definitely not gonna have the same stuff to cook with that we have. And I wanna leave you with a quote, and this is a quote by a gentleman the name of Wes Jackson. He runs the Land Institute. He, it's, it's an institute dedicated to um, basically reintroducing perennial grasses and grains uh, in the Great Plains in the States. And this is a quote that we all kind of live by at the restaurant. And remind us that we are just a very small part of a, a tradition, a very small part of something much bigger um, that we really want to have an impact on. And it's not about us. It's about what's going, what's going to happen in the future. Thank you very much. JP, thank you very much.